Good afternoon. My name is Juliana Ravelo. I'm a member of INSTAR team. Um, first, of, first of all, I want to uh, thank my colleague here uh, for joining me today in this conversation about practices to learn and, and heal. And to Hakabe for brought all us together the first time. Uh, then Ecover Cities for um, reunite us again, and after that, Instar, now uh, Tania and Documenta 15, also to to Esther for for helping me to clarify my my ideas in terms of format uh, from her, her experience in in camp. Um, I would like to start introducing my, my guest, um, Sasha Baila. Hi there. Hello. <laughs> Sasha is a curator, researcher, writer, and editor working at the, at the intersection of care, feminism, and social transformation. Um, Hello. <laughs> Very happy to be here. Hello, Juliana. Hello, Karim. And hello, Sabina. Nice Thank to see you, you all. Um, and then Sabina. Hola, Sabina. Hola. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. Sabina, it's an independent researcher and facilitator, curator, and artist pedagogue and learner working in between the emergent transversalities of cultural, educational, and artistic practices. She's a founding member of Foresta Collective and Foresta Kids, a fluid transdisciplinary collective designing and facilitating experiential formats dedicated to a collective cultivation of ecological future through a strategy of awareness, interaction, and care. Uh, very well, uh, be very welcome, Sabina. Thank um, you. And then uh, Karim, next to me, uh, is an educator and activist. He founded SILAS, uh, which, is, uh, which means Cairo Institute for Liberal of liberal arts and science in 2013. As an educator, Karim combi combined his background in philosophy and urbanism with Qigong practice, tea ceremony, and cooking. Currently, he's hosting a course uh, on promises and limitations of modern colonial science in Silas, Alexandria, Egypt. Do you want? Greet the audience. <laughs> so um, the other guest uh, supposed to be Daniela. I, gu I guess she's going to join us in some point uh, during the conversation. Uh, Daniela is artist, activist, curator, educator, and researcher. She grew, uh, she grew up in the tropical concrete jungle in the shore of the Atlantic. 
and live in various bioregions until she moved to grass in 2010. Um, her work is extremely diverse, uh, site and cocktails specific. It takes shape through installation, performances, texts, and creation of spaces of encountering, encounters and learning environment of all ages. And I really want to say, uh, I also invite uh, Francisco Morejon, uh, who also directed this institute in Ecuador, he has to go for uh, surgery and he couldn't join us today, but I want to send him uh, our wishes for a quick recovery. Um, well, I hope uh, he can hear us. Um, okay, I think I'm going to start with three rounds of questions. Um, then we can take some questions from, from you. Um, I don't know if, uh, do you want to start, Sasha? Sakia? Sakia. Um, it depends what the question is. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. <laughs> so, um, what is your experience in learning healing processes other than schooling education or traditional institutions? Um, it's a very complex question because I think it, it comes with many questions of definitions, right? What do we understand as a traditional institution? What do we understand as um, healing, for example? Um, and I think learning is something that is involved in sort of most processes in our lives and in institutions and outside of institutions um, that we encounter. Um, but what I can share maybe is my, my experience as the artistic director of 2019 and 20 of an art space in Northern Germany. It's called M1 Hohenlockstedt. Um, and so this was a small town of 6,000 inhabitants and they have um, changing artistic directors. So I proposed a participatory program on questions of care and I try to engage uh, the local community through, yeah, let's say um, easy access formats. Um, I try to really lower the, the hurdles for people to attend. Um, and so we had different workshops. One of them was the workshop series called Care for Caregivers, where once per month I invited one artist who addressed one theme that is sort of central when you provide care work that you ine inevitably have to deal with. So for example, um, one workshop was on questions of trust with the um, per Paris-based uh, performance artist, um, Miriam Lefkowitz. So there was different performative gestures um, also in public space on how to relate to one another and trust one another. Then there would be a workshop, for example, with Julieta Aranda, um, who did a workshop on questions of time, how to, um, yeah, how to relate to one another and maybe also resist uh, certain neoliberal conceptions of time. And so, for example, we cooked collectively um, over the weekend. So what I'm trying to say is that um, this might be a sort of traditional institution in the sense that it is an art foundation but then again they try to do things differently and i think that even the artistic directorships that they offer as a kind of cultural residency in itself is maybe like i don't know if that's too much to say a micro sort of institution within itself where you can establish your own let's say principles or set of rules of how you want to organize things and through this process, I started to think more and more about this idea of caring infrastructures. So what does it mean to not only think or speak of care or to address care as a theme, but really to sort of implement it in the kind of infrastructures um, that we put in place? So what is necessary for people to attend the public programming, for example, who have children? Um, may it be for the artists that have kids or the, the participants, 
So we would have on-site uh, childcare that was free and accessible for everyone. We would have shared meals. Um, so, but to think really from the necessities, the local necessities and to expand from that and to build a kind of framework for accessibility. This was really key and there's kids knocking on the door. Um, so this is how I try to think of maybe not healing, but sort of caring for um, a kind of condition in our society that is neglected. And that's the condition of how care givers and care workers and also often care receivers are treated. Um, and to try to do this on a, let's say, micro level, right? To start from the local, from where we are and try to see what is it, what is the agency that we can have in order to, to do things differently. Um, yeah, maybe this from my side in the beginning, and I'm happy to elaborate um, in the next in the next step. Thank you, Saskia. Um, Karin? Yes, uh, what's your experience in learning healing processes other than schooling, education, or traditional institution? Because you have a more traditional institution, let's say, you try these uh, kind of liberal art institutes, which um, have this source in a, let's say, traditional uh, learning, or but you try to teach in a more emancipated way. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. Um, so my work, I take you to Cairo, uh, a huge city, <laughs> unlike the 6,000 uh, inhabitants in northern Germany, there's probably at this point 30 million people in greater Cairo uh, in what otherwise is very poorly managed in terms of traffic and infrastructure. And in the, in the heart of uh, the historical part of Cairo, I set up a school after the revolution of 2011 um, called Silas. Cairo Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So the idea of liberal arts education is to emphasize the humanities and the social sciences, arts and culture, which is something that is lacking in the, in the higher education in Egypt and the Arab world more generally. Um, and the idea was to create a space that could preserve the spirit of the revolution, continue to bring people from different um, class backgrounds, cultural backgrounds together to ask more fundamental questions as to how do we want to live in a post-revolutionary Egypt, which, as you probably all know, has backfired and the there has been a military takeover uh, and things have been worsening since then. But within that space, we're still trying to bring together uh, up to 150 students in different classes um, to study the humanities, as I said. Um, and in terms of care, what we try to do is to, to create a space that would feel more homey, more home-like to, to the, uh, the students that come to us are adults. Um, so homey in the sense that people would come, take off their shoes, sit down, not necessarily on chairs, but on the floor, uh, on cushions, on carpets, make a cup of tea and sit together, listen to each other, um, discuss the readings that we um, ask them to do. Um, and in terms of healing, one of the, I can say a little bit more afterwards during the conversation, but one of the things that not just us, but other people within the Ecoversities Alliance, which I can also talk about more afterwards, are trying to do is to heal from the diploma disease. So we're trying to create a space that is anti-credentialist. So we feel that credentialism and the pursuit of degrees, just for the sake of having a piece of paper or a diploma in your hand, can be very stifling or can be very counterproductive. So anti-credentialist in the sense that people come to us not in pursuit of a degree, but in pursuit of learning, not under any pressure or in a rush, but to take their time, to slow down if needed. So in order to make sure that everyone is in included, everyone's voice is heard. Um, one other thing that is perhaps interesting, and we can also talk about more in the conversation, is that the space is bilingual. So it's Arabic and English. So negotiating um, or coming to terms with bilinguality, I think, is another way of, of healing ourselves from 
especially in the context of a post-colonial society, um, with the heritage of you know the the, Eng the British occupation in Egypt and English being a, a foreign language, how do we both welcome it but also um, welcome the Arabic language, and how do we sort of dance with both? Uh, make sure that people from wealthier backgrounds who often speak better English than Arabic, even in the Egyptian context, can express themselves freely and easily. People from, um, yeah, who speak Arabic primarily can express themselves. And also welcoming this, these moments of feeling lost, not understanding exactly what is said in the other language, and making sure that there is time and room for translation. So translation as a modality or of healing also, of slowing down, of finding uh, meanings within through translation. So that's perhaps something that I could add also to the conversation. Uh, you also stress this idea of everyday um, reading related to education. Like you try to make a, a learning process like every day. It's not like a goal you have to uh, achieve in a certain t time, but every day you can uh, do your own, uh, let's say, uh, pass or... Um, so one thing perhaps in the, that is very context specific to the context of Cairo, which again, as I said, is a very crowded city, a very noisy city, uh, the traffic is out of control. When we try to encourage students to engage with the readings while they're on the public buses, and while they're coming to see us through podcasts, through other modalities that they can incorporate into this otherwise messy <laughs> and chaotic environment. Um, yeah, that would be the short answer to what you're asking about, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, now uh, there is Daniela. Welcome, Daniela. So I'm I, now I'm going to invite Sabina to share with us uh, her uh, her experiences and practices. Uh, you with uh, Foresta Collective work with more with this, uh, let's say, ecological metaphor, which is not actually a metaphor, it's more like a language. So you have this stational academy and you bring your uh, learning environment to the forest. <laughs> Tell us more about it. <laughs> Well, first of all, I really like the angle or the kind of perspective that you included in this question by putting learning and healing together, because usually, I guess, learning is understood as this kind of development or getting something you don't have, whether it's like a skill or knowledge or whatever, but putting it together with healing, for me, it speaks to regeneration or it can include unlearning, healing, right? This... Um, and yeah, with Foresta Collective, we, we have this format we call Seasonal Academy for adults. We also have School Without Walls that we work with children. And I guess the main focus or the main idea is that we understand these learning formats as a collective practice, as a kind of a mutual school or a place where learning happens in reciprocity and indeed in this way forest is is both as a metaphor but also very directly how you know an ecosystem exists in reciprocity and in mutual attentiveness so so also within the seasonal academy with foresta everyone becomes a teacher and a student you know we all we are all here to learn and we are all here to give something to others and to um to unlearn our mastery, uh, which is something that we feel we need um, for decolonizing, first of all, our minds and our ways of, of dealing with each other. Um, another thread that we have is uh, learning through the body or kind of inviting this, you could say, primordial language back into the learning process and trying to avoid being in the head space only, but including the senses, including movement. Um, 
And it's also kind of an inquiry into maybe more metaphorical layer of human embeddedness into the larger body of the earth. Um, I also liked what Karim, you said, and I think this is also important, mainly holding space and how we hold space for others and how we hold space for the emergence, for, for something, for the unknown, where at the same time people feel at ease, where it's not like an, an insecure space, but it's, 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 it is kind of allowing emergence to take place. And at the same time, everyone can still feel belonging and acceptance and kind of um, rootedness in some sense. So, so, yeah, I guess what I mean with mutual school is that we are not producing something for others to take or to consume or to, to get or whatever education can mean in, in other formats, maybe in more traditional formats but inviting people to join the process of thinking together, sensing, feeling, um, I guess being attentive together. This, this attentiveness maybe is one of the keys that attentiveness is a practice of intimacy and care, right? Where you come closer to ecologists of everyday life, doesn't matter what is the subject that, that we are approaching. Thank you. Uh, well, Daniela, your work with, next to uh, Daily Reading Collective, it's more about time in terms of duration and host this, uh, let's say, tension between uh, past and future, and, and also hold this openness needed for encounter in a multicultural context. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me, and so nice to see all of you. I am outside right now in a festival, which I'm working. So I don't know if you can hear me well. Is it okay? Okay, I'm from Ireland. I feel all very small. <laughs> My colleague Penina Lezarogol, who is also part of the Daily Rhythms Collective, is in the festival now. We're doing a piece for mothers at the moment, developing, doing some field research. So I'm, I thought we would finish early and I would have more uh, a kind of calmness to talk to you guys. But yeah, so I'm from the field research right near. It's, uh, it's nice to hear all Karim, Sasha, and Sabina. They, I didn't know what if someone talked before, but I, that's what I heard. And it's really inspiring. But now it's also hard for me to dive in this multi-dimensional talk I don't know where uh, where to start but um, yeah the daily rhythms collective is a collective that started in the city of Graz where I'm now we I'm in the park uh, the Algarven and it's a city with 300,000 people in Austria it's becoming more multicultural cultural for the last years as we know the demographic changes are um, affecting all all the world and here especially it used to be a very close city but has been changing for a long for the past let's say 10 years and uh, the daily rhythms collective is a collective that started to create in the city only with migrant women i am originally born in brazil and i've been living in europe for the past 20 years so 10 of them in graz and our, our intention in this collective was to create more uh, space for more inclusive forms of coexistence and yeah we work with different uh, very different ways we do a lot of um, let's say the healing first of all is, starts with us as a collective the people who take part of it and how we work but uh, it goes also in the sphere in the public sphere when we, we start to work with different communities that inhabit this city we started last year with this uh, uh, research on what we call ancestral futurism, is to understand the future is ancestral to research on our ancestrality. The people who are in the collective uh, are now, in the collective now were born all, all out of Europe. 
but most of but all living in Europe for at least 10 or maybe 20 years. And we try to understand this up, up, being uprooted, rerouting, how we reconnect with our ancestry in this um, complexity of belonging and how we do it collectively. So for us, it's, uh, this uh, healing process is a learning experience for all of us, how to, to redefine ourselves and how we co-create the that we live in. Yeah, so I think it's a lot of also our questions, what kind of ancestors do we want to be? And so which practices we do now and how we can uh, create a more uh, sensitive, critical and inclusive spaces in the city. Yeah, that's what I would have to say now. I don't know if uh, I'm really triggered with the conversations we can have. Is it okay? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I kind of going to merge the next uh, two questions. Uh, the first, the first one is I, I really want you like answer in a way like let's say operational. I mean how to do it. And the last one, it's like more philosophical. <laughs> so it's uh, it's more open and. Uh, so the first is how poetics and theory fit each other, and the other one is are art and education renouncing uh, to the specificity in favor of more dynamic integration with life. This last one I think is very meaningful in the in in the context of this uh, documenta. Um, who wants to start now? Karin? Sabina? Um, well, uh, maybe to the first question, poetics. It's, I'm, I'm thinking of it as kind of poetic attitude to life um, that, that implies heightened sensitivity perceptiveness to different voices, textures, gestures, colors, um, you know, something that we could say um, wakes up this experience of being alive and, and attentiveness to, 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 to all the different qualities, enlivenment, we could say also this word. And yeah, I think it's crucial that theory and poetic can have a conversation rational, um, more rational aspects can use this other eyes to see otherwise you could say or um, or poetry could offer like a way of escaping the totalitarian structures of thought or invite to experiment to play um, to be free from conventional restraints. I mean, I don't know if, if, if it's operational enough, but this is how I would, uh, how I would approach, would approach this, th this question. And then in, in a way it relates to, to your second question, because re renouncing specificity means deleting some kind of very clear borders or, um, I think, you know, contemporary culture, we, we, can think, we can think of it as the world trying to re-engineer itself, right? Like where we try to re-engineer our modes of being with each other, with um, not cutting entanglement into fragments, but integrating. So, so, so in a way, I think this losing specificity or, or renouncing specificity and integrating with life is a very healthy healthy process um, because whatever fixations into fragments we have made humans have made um, it's just a, a map a kind of a map of reality but but a map is not the same as reality right and sometimes it's good to burn old maps and to get lost or or to go with this cartography of lostness so that we can find our way again um, or catalyze something kind of 
this this process of burning a map or getting getting lost can catalyze something that maybe feels more honest or with more respect to the entangled dynamic nature of things. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, um, Karim. Mm, okay, let me repeat the question for myself to think about it. So you're asking about how does uh, poetics, poetry, and, and theory feed each other? Uh, it's not poetry, it's more, more like poetics, like uh, a way of um, making. Yeah. Mm, I mean, as far as I can see, in, in, with regards to higher education and people are trying to reimagine higher education like we're doing right now and, and, and think about it out loud, is many people are noticing that universities, traditional ones, modern colonial universities are falling apart, that there's some structural damages that are appearing, um, be it students who have to take out loans to pay for their study fees and so they're, they leave university with a lot of debt, uh, faculty that is underpaid or uh, undersalaried, um, and increasingly strong management, um, introducing more and more standardization at universities. Anyways, there's a lot of structural damages that are beginning to appear, and so people are moving out or walking out of universities, be it academics or students, and looking for possibilities elsewhere uh, to self-organize and so on. And I think what we're trying to do in Egypt for the last 10 years is to make, um, create a space that is accessible, like uh, Saskia was saying earlier, uh, through a sliding scale. So a, a way of financing a study program that takes into account people's financial ability to contribute to such a study program. So um, I think that's one, one way, a more practical thing to consider. Uh, what are people able to contribute in a given time, cons considering the, uh, the volatility of, you know, the global economy and so on. Um, and in terms of poetics, I'm still thinking about the question, but um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't have anything on my mind right now, but I'm going to keep thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I think the first question is more about the relation about uh, learning and healing. But now this question is uh, about the relation uh, between uh, doing and thinking. May, maybe I can jump in, Karen, if you don't, if you let me. If you're yes, please. Needing a time to think. Well, I think. We, uh, in general, we should not separate this because, you know, like, as also Karin is saying, the damage of the main system is that because we separate things. And I think if we're trying to merge art and life, merge education, learning and healing, we have to put it all together back, you know, like it's the mind and the heart and the hands, how the hands and the mind and the heart come together. So. For me, poetics is a way of expression of thinking, feeling. Thinking, feeling is a very beautiful, I, I know all of the speakers are familiar with, you also it's all on your email about the Buen Vivir idea or a way of living that is bringing things back together. And I think this is our main task as, through all of this, not to keep separating our bodies and doing our own, like cutting our bodies and our soul and our spirit from each other and let them be together so yeah thank you daniela um so saskia um do you want you to know, take the job <laughs> okay now i have many things on my mind and i don't know where to start um I want to come back to what Daniela just said, but to answer the question, Juliana, um, in regards to poetics and theory, um, I have to admit it's a question that I didn't ask myself uh, before like that. But now in the conversation, I was thinking that maybe poetics for me, and I don't only see it as a verbal, but also a visual um, language, so to speak, oftentimes 
for me, poetics can be an entry point. It's something that I personally feel drawn to when I read something, when I see something um, that I want more of, you know? So it's maybe the spark of curiosity that then opens the doors to be willing to engage more. And then maybe through that lead to an engagement with a theory, for example, that we otherwise would have not um, done. So, and you wanted something practice-based. <laughs> so what do I mean by that? Um, so for example, in the course of my cultural programming at M1, which I mentioned in the beginning, um, so in order to communicate the, the workshop series, we had flyers and I didn't say, you know, famous artists from New York, Julieta Aranda is gonna come and you should all be there. But actually it, um, it had a question on it. So all of the workshop with the different themes that they had asked a different question in big letters. So when you walk past it in the supermarket, in the pharmacy, you would, for example, read something like, what is the value of my labor when it's unpaid and invisible? Or what is, um, what are the conditions of mutual trust? Um, or what kind of relations do I want to establish in my everyday life? So you would have these kind of maybe poetic um, questions. And if you've dealt with these things or with these tensions in your everyday life, you'll be hooked, you'll feel drawn, you will want to take the card home and then maybe inscribe yourself into a workshop that otherwise you would have never gone because you feel you have nothing to do with art and you don't know what to say or to do. So um, maybe I would see poetics in that case as a kind of strategy um, of engagement that enables to um, yeah, connect with audiences through a maybe more of a intuitive or emotional response. Um, yeah, that would be my my thoughts to the to the first question. Um, I hope it it makes sense. Um, and then in regards to the second question, um, Juliana, that I personally think is worded. I'm having difficulties understanding the exact way how you word it, but we spoke before, and from what I understood there is that you're interested in sort of what happens when this distinction between art and life doesn't become as specific anymore, when, when it becomes blurry. Right, Juliana? And this is something that now Daniela was advocating for. And I think this is really interesting because this is of course nothing new, but especially in the context now of Documenta 15 is something that keeps on coming up where the question is like, is this art um, keeps on being phrased? Um, and this is, of course, a question that throughout our art history has always been there. Sort of the demarcation line of what is art and what is life and what is documentation or whatsoever has always been asked. And I think it always needs to be negotiated. But the question that I want to ask in return is who benefits from upholding the boundary of what art is and where life supposedly begins, right? So when we have people coming to Documenta that question whether this is art, I feel like oftentimes it is also questioning whether these practices have the right to be in that space. And I think this is where we have to get the conversation started, right? Because if then art is sort of the justification of, of these struggles that exist around the world to be in a space, to be looked at, to be heard, to be funded. Um, and then in return to say, well, if it's not art, it shouldn't be here. Then this is where it becomes a problem. So I think it's actually really political <laughs> to discuss and actually to expand um, this notion of what we understand as art. Um, and, and I don't mean it in a very particular case of like, well, if it's edited like this or if it does that, but really, and maybe this turns into the sort of more philosophical discussion, Juliana, that you mentioned in the beginning is like, um, yeah, who has the right to, to define that? Um, and who is in power yeah, to sort of continue to put in these limits of what is art and what is life? and who benefits from that. Um, and I'd be really happy to also hear everybody else's thoughts um, from the audience, but also from, from the other speakers in the panel. Thank you. 
thank you, uh, Saskia, for all those in, uh, insights. Um, I guess we can open for other questions. Um, do you want to add something, Karin? Um, from what I could hear, I really <laughs> enjoyed what you said, especially in the beginning. But then throughout the conversation, your voices became very... Uh, oh, really? remote and so it was hard to follow what you were saying <laughs> okay but i would Sorry. love to have this conversation with i know daniela and saskia already and sabina especially what you were saying was very inspiring uh i would so if at some point we could reconnect <laughs> but wait, and, can uh, I, so and follow up not... on this conversation i would appreciate that sorry did you not hear me the entire time also the first time that i was talking Um, it's really hard to hear you. Oh, no. If I'm without the headset, can you hear me better? It's, it's more about the acoustic of the whole. So it's... Okay. Okay. So I, I think we can... I can like, hear you better. I can hear you better when you have the headphones. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. I, I, maybe I can just summarize just the thing that I tried to say and hopefully you understand what I'm saying. Is that I think it's the distinction between what is art and what is life is political because it's also a question of power. Who holds the power to decide what is art and what is not and who benefits from keeping the distinction clear and who would lose something or maybe lose privileges by expanding a certain concept of art. I don't know if you understood that. Um, so thank you, Saskia. Uh, Sabina, Daniela, do you want to add uh, something else? Well, I think we are saying goodbye. Um, if anyone wants to send us some question, we're going to be mindful and answer you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Good to, good to talk to you. Bye. Okay. See you next Thank time. You. Thank you all. Okay. See you. Ciao. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.